Okay, um, we are recording. Welcome back, everybody. We've had a bit of a hiatus for a week um, as I was away, but last week you were in the uh, uh, tender care of uh, Mr. Beatty. So I'm very, very grateful, Beatty, for you running those um, those sessions. I hope uh, those of you who attended uh, um, uh, had a great time. I'm sure you did. And um, today or this week, we're back with the um, Back to the South study course. The purpose of which is to at least initially um, go through the Getty play by play and um, notice things that we might uh, miss if we're trading on the floor. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we're back this week to do the poses, <clears throat> which is where we left off last week um obviously um this uh this back to the self study course thus far has been um principally run by me so you're getting um, principally my view of the getty you're getting a lot of my analysis but it is of course only um i'm only one person of many and um like all the teachers at emma we would um, will want you to be convinced of the same evidence or by the same evidence that we're convinced by rather than believing something is so just because we we said it. So in that light, um, we're going to jump right into where we left off, which is uh, going through the poses of the sword in two hands. So just to take um, a bit of a an aerial view, just so we can refresh our memories. So we're in the sword in two hands uh, section of the Getty manuscript in Fiore. And um, at least by my... Um, uh, my analysis, there's five main, or rather six main parts of this section. One uh, of the two, of the sword and two hand section of the Getty anyway. One is the guards, the collection of guards. The second is the cuts. The third is some prefatory commentary about the sword that Fiore makes. The fourth is the Largo section. The fifth is the Strato section. And then finally we have a master which belongs to neither, or at least appears to belong to neither Largo or Strato. And that kind of encompasses the, um, <clears throat> properly speaking, sword and two hands section. So since we've begun the sword and two hands section, we've begun with the collection of guards. In this collection, we began with a uh, very large and important paragraph uh, ta that talks about a lot of things about posta and, and footwork. And then we had six posta, which are all um, dissimilar from one another. One, two, three, four, five, six. So uh, th th this is my this is my designation. Um, but we began with posta Sagittaria, then Acuda Lunga, posta Breve Serpentina, posta de Croce Barstarda, posta di Donna, and then finally this big this big guy. Oh. Um, Oh, did someone post that in the Discord chat? Um, someone, um, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, if someone from Emma Guelph, could you do me a favor? Could you try and find that um, Scholars of Fury post with that guy, uh, the, the guy recreated this sword? Yes, I'll um, do that. Th thank you, BD. I'd love that. So um, I think it was the Exiles in the UK, but someone recreated uh, this this sword. And as a, remi uh, as a, a reminder, um, we speculated, or rather I speculated in the, the session where we looked at that sword, that in the image, the sword that Fiore is referring to is this one, which he actually talks about two different kinds of swords uh, at the end of the sword and two hands, uh, sorry, the sword and armor section. And um, the characteristics of the sword in that other play in, this, in the poster section, I argued, uh, is very similar, if not identical, to this sword here, seen at Folio 35RC. Um, so that was a really, a really interesting little tidbit of neat information. Um, and uh, I speculated at the time that it would be cool to see a recreation of it. And um, somebody just recently did one in the UK. So uh, BD will find that for us and we'll get to see it. It looks, looks so, so badass. It's pretty sweet. So we'll get an actual real image of what this sword is which is really neat. 
But yeah, so that was our first session of the Sword in Two Hands. Secondly, or the second session, we took the first six of 12, um, of the 12 next post -its. So these first six post here, the ones dissimilar from one another, they all have some interesting commentary and, and we went through that. But Fury kind of, at least verbally, uh, separates the, these post uh from the ones that follow, from t the 12 that follow. And you can tell that these are the 12, not only because the text for this first play here, um, the text of the first play with the red text, the first uh, poster with the red text, the text reads, here begin the guards of the sword and two hand, which are 12. So we have this group of 12 and the group of six donated uh, uh, by, by text and also by image, because in these images, all of the, these 12 posts to have this red uh, red label on them, noting that the posta is either pulsativa, instabile, or stabile. Um, and we, we talked about, um, well, we saw pulsativa and we saw instabile in the last session. We haven't seen any stabile postas yet. Um, breve is going to be our first one, which is going to, which is ironic given the, oh no, we talked, we, we looked at Porta de Fera Mezzana. So this is, this was our one stabile posta. Um, so we did talk about all three uh, different connotations, although of course, if anybody uh, wants to reprise them, please let me know. As long as, or, or I mean, as well as ask any questions at any time, right? As, as usual, if you have questions, please do, do ask them. Um, Hi, Aaron. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind going over the uh, Positiva and Stabile and Stabile again, that would be uh, awesome. Sure, sure. Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely can do that. So, again, like I said, every posta in this section of 12, uh, the last six of which we're at least going to do today, um, they have this uh, this red label on them, Pulsativa, Instabile, and Stabile. So Fiore doesn't out and out right <clears throat> define what these mean. He doesn't say pulsativa means this, instabile means this, stabile means this. We kind of, um, the scholars of Fiore believe we've, believe they've settled on an understanding of these words based on the context of the posta and their understanding of how, what's going on, okay? So um, all that is to say is that there are different opinions about what these, um, I'm gonna exit Steam so that that stops popping up. Um, <laughs> there are different um, opinions about what some of these words mean, though um, the opinions do not vary wildly. There are definitely some debates uh, in Fiori scholar, uh, scholar circles where the opinions do have quite a degree of variability, but more or less everyone agrees on in broad strokes on what these three things mean: pulsativa, stabile, and instabile. Um, and as usual, I'm not intending to get too big, uh, too deep into the weeds uh, on super super kind of obscure topics, so I'll just gloss over them broadly. So, again, broadly speaking, um, let's look at stabile and instabile first. So, <clears throat> stabile and instabile appear to refer to whether or not the posta changes or often remains uh, fixed. The intuitive English understanding of instabile and stabile is to take them somewhat, to take the words somewhat literally. Well, you know, instabile clearly means unstable and stabile clearly means stable, right? So a common, uh, and it's still common to this day, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it's, it's wrong, but a, a common uh, interpretation of stabile and instabile is that the stabile postas are unstable and the sense of what that means is, well, you know, instabile posters are unstable. What are things that are unstable? Well, they're kind of wobbly, you know, they can't stand firm. They're, you know, they're, they move, 
So instabula posters are posters that, you know, are, they're not good to, to, to just hold, right? You can't stand on them. You can't rest on them. They're not good to just, to just hold as opposed to stabile posters, which you could sit in a stabile post all day, right? They're safe to hold, to, to, to rest in firmly, right? <clears throat> so that's kind of the, that's a, a common sense of the, the meaning of instabile and stabile. The instabile posters are posters that you, that you shouldn't lie in, right? When you're squaring off with your opponent in true distance at the time of the hand, body, foot, or a, a distance of the hand, body, foot, uh, you don't want to lie in the instabile posters. So, for example, um, posta di finestra, right? Or posta longa. They're both instabile, right? Um, <clears throat> whereas um, porta di ferro mezzana is stabile, and boar's tooth is stabile, and coda lunga on the right is stabile. <clears throat> okay. But um, a little more, I would say, nuanced uh, interpretation of what stabile and instabile mean has to do with <clears throat> whether or not the posta uh, has change uh, as a core part of its, of its usage, right? So um, I think Greg Mele and, and crew, um, Sean Hayes and, and whatnot, and some of our, our sort of Fiori brothers and sisters in North America, um, uh, the ones we identify with anyway, have the word, the, use the word mutable, I believe, to, in place of instability. And that's probably, a, that's probably a more nuanced take on this, um, in, in my view anyway. And by mutable or, you know, a mutable, what they mean is that if you're holding a poster that's instabile, the poster is going to change when you use it. Right, the post is going to vary a lot. So, you know, posta longa instabile. What does this mean? Does this mean that you can't lie in posta longa? No, but it means that if you use posta longa, you're going to be shifting into other posters very quickly, right? You're going to be throwing, po you know, you're putting that point in someone's face, you're probing, like, let's, let's read the posta longa uh, text. This is posta longa full of deception. Okay, deception implies movement, right? She, she can probe the opponent's guard to see if she can deceive him. If it is possible to strike with a thrust, she knows how to do it. She also knows how to, av uh, how to avoid cuts and then deliver cuts when it is possible. More than other guards, she can employ deception. So the language of posta longa, I'm just picking this as an example of an instabula posta. The language is of mutability. Right, it's a poster that has a lot of change in common in it. Same with a finestra, right? You you can hold finestra, absolutely you could, right? And it's definitely a provocative stance to, to lie, you know, to, uh, to lie in, but you're not gonna receive attacks in it, right? If you're attacked and you're in finestra, you're going to change, right? You're gonna act. Whereas something like port, uh, posta porta di ferro mezzana, you could receive attacks in this posta, right? This posta is stabile such that you could lie in it and have someone give you a fendente or, a, or you know, whatever, and you could act directly from that posta to mitigate the threat rather than having to change or utilize other posta depending on what attack they, they gave you, right? Um, so that's a, in a broad in a broad sense that's the distinction between stabile and instabile. Now pulsativa, I think broadly speaking is well it's it's often it's often uh, ag agreed I think by Furious that pulsativa is sort of like stabile plus. So I don't think there are any examples of pulsativa posters that are instabile. Although, as I say that, well, this is posta di donna, which is not posta finestra. So posta di donna is a, is a stabile posta, uh, though all of, the, all of the words for the posta di donna in this section are pulsativa. But, you know, full iron gate, for example, right? Posta tutta porta di ferro, full iron gate. This is clearly a stabile posta. If porta di ferro mezzana is stabile, 
then you're damn sure that Tutu Pota de Ferro is Tebile. But here we have Pulsativa. So what does Pulsativa mean? Well, it, it may mean Stabile plus. And what that means is not only is it a Stabile posta, but it, it, is, a, it is a Stabile posta that can, um, so Fiore says, provide very robust defenses, right? Very robust defenses. And I don't want to put any more English uh, in there, you know, um, strong cuts and things like that, you know, whatever. It can, it can uh, give you robust defenses, str you know, strong cuts in a way that some of the other Stabile posters can't. So, for example, uh, Breve is Stabile. We're going to look at this one first. Um, Porto de Ferro Mezzana is Stabile. But the kind of cuts that are incumbent in these posta, they're not as robust as the kind of cuts incumbent in La Donna or in Tutto Porto de Ferro. So Fiore seems to be saying, okay? So long story short, Graham, to answer your question, the difference between pulsativa, uh, instabile, stabile. Instabile, stabile mean um, whether the post is immutable or not, whether it will change dramatically to respond to different uh, threats or whether it can remain, uh, remain itself and deal with threats that come. And pulsativa is sort of a stabile plus where not only can you lie in it um, and uh, receive receive any threats that um, that are brought to you but it also allows for very robust uh, defensive cuts does that make sense yeah awesome that was a great explanation thanks Sweet. Um, yeah uh, okay so that's that's one view um, but that's kind of generally what we're um, what we're working with here um, why doesn't Fiore say give these connotations with these posters no idea great question have no idea um, yeah, all right, so um, blah, blah, blah. We started with these first six here. Um, uh, this, this is a, in our second session. Uh, Tutto Porta di Ferro, uh, La Donna, Finestra, um, Posta di Donna, La Finestra, so the Donna on the left, Di Donna on the left. Posta Longa, Porta di Ferro, Mazzana, and now we're here on Breve. So we're gonna look at Breve, uh, Boar's Tooth, uh, Tail on the right, uh, by Corno, Frontale, and um, uh, another kind of version of Boar's Tooth today. And then maybe we'll move on to the cuts. Does anybody have any questions about anything we've talked about so far or from any of the sessions that we've done in the past? No, okay, sweet. So we'll just move right along. All right. Um, Abidi, if you, if you do end up Cross that image. You can just throw it in the Discord. That'll be. Oh, he did. Awesome. Okay. Can everybody see uh, see this this image here in Discord? So there's yep. this. There's the sword, and that little metal slider there. You see, you can slide down the down the uh, uh, the, the blade there. Love and it. Isn't that isn't the fucking awesome? I just think that's the coolest. What a what a badass weapon there. So mystery solved in, in a way you know that's what that's that's what we're looking at in the manuscript isn't that isn't that neat i just think that's so cool um uh, anyway all right breve starting off with uh with a schizophrenic posta so let me just pull this off to the side so uh, okay all right so starting off at the top uh alex would you like to read the text for us oh, this is folio 24 rc for those of you who are following along alex go ahead this is post a breve which calls for a long blade it is a deceitful, deceitful guard which has no stability it too remains in motion and probes the opponent for an opportunity to thrust and pass forward this guard is more appropriate in armored rather than unarmored combat <laughs> okay so Posta breve. Uh, <clears throat> wow. Well, first of all, let's get the let's get the initial schizophrenia out of the way. Posta breve stabile. And so Fiore says in big red letters, it's stabile. And then in the text, immediately he says, it's a deceitful garbage has no stability. <laughs> so, oh shit. So what's going on here? Um, People. Hmm? Yeah, say again. 
it's literally a deceitful guard. It's telling you it's stable up above, and then it's a deceitful <laughs> guard flying. He's, he's lying. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. I like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So, it, how might we square this circle? How do we think about it, right? Or how? What's one way we might think about it? So, the obvious contradiction with um, this problem here, stabile in the text saying instabile, the obvious contradiction apart from what's said in the text is our experience with, um, with breve, and specifically our experience with breve in other sword arts or with other weapons. So this posta, um, a breve on the right and the left, is, a, is one of those basic human sword postas. Right, and functionally, what it is is it's almost identical. Well, in fact, you know, well, yeah, I, I guess I can't, I can't abuse that term. Almost, it's almost identical to tutto porto di ferro. Okay, or um, a tutto porto di ferro on the um, on the right, and uh, boar's tooth on the left. Uh, yeah, the boys are on the left. So it's almost identical to these posters because the hands are in exactly the same place, effectively. The difference is the point is forward. Okay. The point is forward. Here the point is forward, and here the point is back. So in many, many other sword arts, this hands at the hips, point forward guard, is a staple guard. And it's a guard that you hold. And it's a very useful guard. It does tons of stuff. So it's obviously impossible. Well, it's, it's not rational to say, well, you know, this guard is stable when you're doing I-33, but it's unstable when you're doing Fiore, whatever the hell that means. Right? I don't I don't go for that kind of logic, right? If it's stable, then it's stable. It's stable in uh, um, you know, a bolognese, it's stable in I thirty three, and it's stable in Fury, or if it's not, it's not stable in anyone. So the you know, so how to how to square that circle? Well if we read stabile, right, if we read the stability concept as mutable, right? then that partially solves our problem. Because while it's true that all other, you know, or many, many other sword arts use this posta, it's also true that postas that are point forward tend to change a lot by nature. And they tend to change a lot by nature partially because, again, getting registration on your enemy's sword is one of it's, it's one of the if not the critical piece of information that the swordsman seeks directly in order to fight right without knowing by touch where their sword is it's um an, an impossibly risky uh decision to commit your sword to their body right you have to have a mountain of extra evidence to assure you that their sword isn't going to enter you um, if you commit your sword to their body without being in, uh, in, in, in touch or having just recently, in the, in, the, in the next moment or in the moment before, literally touched their sword. So whenever your sword is, is uh, extended, whenever the sword is in front of you, you make it much easier for your opponent to give registration on your weapon. And not wanting him to get solid registration on your weapon, it's necessarily going to end up changing a lot, right? Whereas all of the point backward guards deny initial registration to the enemy, right? And you choose when your sword touches theirs because you're going to bring it out. Your enemy can't can't touch it. Um, one of the interesting stylistic. Um, uh, stylistic flavors of Bolognese swordsmanship, for example, and I-33 as well, actually, to a great extent, 
is that many of the guards, um, many of the guards are very aggressive. The sword is out in front of you, right? And you, as an attacker, your general strategy is to, you know, get at, get, get uh, some touch on their sword and then work your way in effectively, right? And there's all these different strategies you can do to, to get that done. But when two people are fighting and they're both using point forward guards, that's a very aggressive uh, fight. It's a very touch oriented, pay the hell attention kind of fight because registration is right at your fingertips. Whereas if two people are fighting in the kind of style that Fiore seems to like, where there's a lot of guards that are low or guards that are high, but they're point back, registration is harder to get, right? Registration is harder to get. And if your opponent knows what they're doing and they know these single time remedies, then registration is actually difficult to get safely as the attacker. So that's one advantage that these point backward guards kind of kind of give you. Um, noting interestingly, and we'll see this when we eventually get to Vadi, that the Italians talk about these point backward guards, uh, the later Italians talk about these point backward guards as um, something the old masters used to like, or used to do. And the point forward guards became fashionable um, to, to, the, to later Italians. Now I'm using those words fashionable. I'm saying that, you know, uh, I'm implying that there's a stylistic choice here as to where, whether to fight with predominantly point forward guards or to fight with predominantly point, point backward guards. You know, if I had to guess, I would say that that's something stylistic rather than structural about swordsmanship, but that's a whole big, whole other discussion. Um, but um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so Breve. Breve, why is it stabile? But it says it's unstable, right? So um, one way to square the circle may be to understand stabile, this, this um, label here, as saying whether or not you can um, to respond directly to threats or whether it changes a lot, right? So first of all, maybe this is just a mistake. Okay, it's perfectly possible for there to be a mistake. There are a bunch of mistakes between the text and the images. Although technically this is a mistake of text to text, right? Because stabile is of course text and here it is. So that, that label could be a mistake. We don't know who wrote the label. But it could be, it also could be the case that, you know, by deceitful guard, all Fiore means is that it's gonna change a lot. So it's not that you, can, you can't lie in it. It's not that you can't hold it but it's, you should expect it to change quite a bit. And the, the, the guard that we just saw that mentioned deceit a lot, I didn't intend to, 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 to do Posta Longa the other, or uh, five minutes ago, but I did. I was Posta Longa, right? And, uh, you know, Posta Breve and Posta Longa are very similar. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're equal in a point forward sense it's just that posta longa is at a full extension and posta breve is withdrawn, right? But they present the same problem to the enemy uh, that all point forward guards do, uh, including, very importantly, including uh, guards like, um, well, not so much Boris Tooth, I suppose, but certainly uh, Por uh, Porta de Ferro Mezzana, right? This is a, it's important to remember that this is a point forward guard uh, exactly like posta longa and, um, and breve. Right, that gets forgotten a lot. It's part of what makes this guard so uh, powerful. But anyway, so yeah, post the breve, it changes a lot. Um, that's probably something. That's probably what this is, right? But why is why is there really the obvious contradiction? Stability and stability? No idea. But um, that's my guess. That Fury thinks that it, uh, it's got lots of deceit, so it changes a lot. And he's and he's using the word stability, uh, stabilita. So, I'd need a, a linguist to say that. Mm -hmm. If, uh, in my experience, sometimes the same word can have two subtly different meanings. Sure, sure, yeah. Subtly different things, mm -hmm. and I think that's what you're looking at here. Perfectly he means possible. stabile in one sense. Yeah. And he means not stab stabile in a second sense. But I, I, I don't know what yeah. the uh, you, stabile translates to stable in English. Right. 
but if you look at the thesaurus, you'll find there's a whole bunch of synonyms for stable. For sure. Which means slightly different thing. For sure. And, you know, and, and there is lots of evidence uh, uh, to for the mutable argument. And one of the reasons why I buy it is um, evidence like this, right? In, in Breve, um, where it says this card has no stability, it also says it remains in motion and probes the opponent for an opportunity to thrust and pass forward, right? It remains in motion. Pro, this isn't Posta Longa, this is a Breve. What does Posta Longa say? Posta Longa says she can probe the opponent's guard to see if she can deceive him. You know what I mean? So I, I hope we're all getting kind of the theme here, right? So Posta Breve, Posta Longa, very, very close, uh, close cousins. Um, Aaron, sorry, can I ask a question? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but like the post longa isn't stable though, is it? Like no. it's, it's okay. That's good. So you think it's just similar in the sense of like the deception aspect? Yeah, that's right. Okay. It, you know, and it, to be totally honest with you, if we're going for the mutable definition, it still makes more sense to me for him to, him to have put instabile here. But you know, what do you do, right? What what does make sense for sure, right? What's you know the the set of evidence, I would say that's more powerful than this label, is the text describing the nature of the guard, which fits not only with the nature of the of guards that seem similar, like Posta Longa, but that also fits our direct experience, right? The text of Posta Breve and Posta Longa fits our direct experience of the guard. So all of that makes sense. It changes a lot, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, he's here. He said it's stabile. Well, maybe it's an error, right? Or maybe we just don't understand exactly what he means. Does that make sense? Um, did I answer yep, your question? You. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, the last thing to say is this card is better in armor. This I think is really fascinating um, because I don't think he shows this card in the armored section. Um, in fact, I'm pretty uh, pretty sure he he doesn't. Um, and in the armored section, there's no real direct. An there's no real direct analog to it. I don't believe. Low serpent. Uh, the short. Short. Short serpent. Um, short serpent here. Yeah. Well, but you know, I mean, but, but yeah, you know, sure, right. The, I mean, the the only guard in the in the uh, in the sword and two hand section, which has both hands on the hilt, is port, uh, posta porta de ferramenta. Right. So here's so here's breve, right? Uh, it's got both hands on the hilt. It's point forward, right? I think the point forward guards are they're they're just substantially different in nature, right? You're in a different situation when you're holding a point forward guard than when your points down. Right, and Fury says this guard is better in armor. Okay, fine, Fury, that's great, but he doesn't show this point forward guard with two hands grasping the hilt in the armored section. Right, the only point forward guard he shows um, where both hands are on the hilt is port, uh, post porta di fermazana. Now, you know. Is this really relevant? Are these the only guards there are? Well, no, so fine. What's the big deal, right? It's just interesting, interesting to, to note. Um, also interesting to note that um, in my experience of seeing people fight in armor, this is not a commonly used guard in, in armor. Though, of course, that could just be stylistic, right? Um, and, and, and one last note about that. So when we're discussing the posters, um, one of the things that's neat to see in the corpus of Emma uh, scholars and, and really uh, fighters uh, in general is the positions they favor, right? And all of these positions in uh, swordsmanship, you know, they're more conducive to some things and less conducive to others. So if you have a person who likes certain attacks, likes certain defenses, right, likes certain kinds of footwork, then by nature, they're going to gravitate to use certain posters more than others, right? And this is some place where you see variation in style between different, different fencers. And, you know, all of these posters are good. All these posters are valid. You know, if you had somebody who fought 
primarily from you know um, from Unicorn and Kotalunga. That would be a very unique kind of way of fighting, and that would be just as valid as anybody who fought from primarily uh, you know Full Iron Gate and Brevet. You know what I mean? So it's important to remember that um, you know all of these posters are here. They're all valid and people's use of them is gonna is gonna change a little bit what they what they look like it's gonna introduce some stylistic and artistic variation as to how each fighter approaches the same sword problem right and isn't that neat, uh, a neat and interesting and it's by studying other people's uh, stylistic uh, variations to the same problems that you face it's by studying those things in videos that can help you unlock and understand the nature of certain poses which maybe you're not really that familiar with right if you really want to um, you know, use a poster more when you're when you're fencing then it's great to try and find videos of fencers that favor that poster or use it all the time right that's a that's a great way of, of, of getting into that right studying their videos anyway all right um, post of breve any any questions about breve I think I've exhausted that talk no Okay, moving on. Denti di Cingaro, Stabile. Folio 24RD. Uh, Andrew, would you like to give us a go? This is Dente di Cingaro. Since it has learned its offenses from the boar, it can deliver strong underhand thrusts all the way to the opponent's face without stepping. It then comes back down with a fendente to the arms. Sometimes it can deliver a thrust to the opponent's face point up while performing a quick quick accrescimento with the front foot and recover back and guard with a fendente to the head and arms. Then it immediately delivers another thrust with the front foot accrescimento. It defends well against the close play. All right. Dente di Cingaro. Now, this is one of the cool, um, this is a play that seems to really channel its namesake, right? Um, the Tooth of the Boar, right? Um, <clears throat> I don't know any of you who have gone on YouTube journeys about uh, boar hunting, but uh, it's quite the experience. I, uh, I encourage you to do it. Um, but boars are pretty, uh, they're pretty crazy animals. And yes, they have these huge tusks, which tear upwards in a similar fashion as this so you know isn't that neat right um a little less mystically though of course what is this poster well this poster is a withdrawn um a withdrawn porta de ferro mezzano right so where, where are we let me get my bearings back here okie dokie so though fury, fury doesn't show this poster on the right side Okay, so here we have a, um, a Porta de Ferro Mezzana and it's extended. The hands are extended low, that's true, but the point is out. And in, in it's, you know, it's post longa but low, right? But on the left side, if he were to bring his hands to the inside of his pelvis, if he were to withdraw his hands just a little bit, maybe six inches or so, then he would have Dente di Cingato. Okay. On the right side, with a sword in two hands, Fiore has decided to favor us with posta porte, uh, a tuta porta di ferro. Right. Although, of course, we could, we could form Dente di Cingato on this side as well. You know, Fiore gives us this posta and it's fine. There's no reason for us to force a, po uh, a Dente di Cingato on the right side here. We just form this, uh, this one. With a sword in one hand, though, you can do it on both sides, on the right and left. Okay. Um, so, what's the difference between Porta de Ferro Mezzana and Dente di Cingaro? Well, like we said before, posters that are point forward, they're very aggressive, right? They can uh, respond very quickly to to attacks. They can threaten with the point. Well, they threaten with the point just by virtue of being there, right? Um, and the, the really neat thing about Porta de Ferro Mezzana is that it's the point is it you know the point could be where it is in Posta Longa in a flick of an eyelash, but it's not there. So 
it's as if you're getting the best of both worlds. You're extended in post longa to probe and deceive, right? And have that point out there. But because the point is down, it's very difficult for the enemy to get registration on your sword, which is one of the critical problems with posts that are point four. So Puerto de Fenomenzon is a really neat and interesting guard in that, in that sense. But it is point four, right? It, uh, it is extended. Then the Dicengaro is withdrawn, so it's technically point forward. You know, it's, well, okay, it's not technically point forward, but it might as well be, right? It is still, it is still, uh, you know, it can become a put the on in, the, in an eyelash, right? And it's still capable of doing everything that this guard can do, but it's withdrawn still further to make the sword really unreachable by the enemy. Right. In order to get the sword out, they're going to have to significantly provoke you or deliver you a strong attack, and your sword will sword will come out. Um, so yeah, it's withdrawn um, because it's withdrawn. It's got a little more oomph to it. Whenever the sword is at your core, the core can power it significantly with a twist of the hips. So there's a, a significant degree of. Uh, force uh, incumbent in uh, Boar's Tooth, even though uh, it is low. And so Boar's Tooth isn't going to be giving pulsativa blows, right? Those are those are more reserved to blows that are kind of use gravity, right? Boar's Tooth is often going to come up in uh, with um, false edge sultano blows, right? Although, of course, you could just transition other pulses. But yeah, so in, in, in a very similar way to the boar, Fiore gives a set of, um, he gives a play where he doesn't actually describe what the enemy's doing. Right, so in my opinion, I don't really think he means us to, to take it as seriously per se or as, as the same as if he was describing a play. Because in a play, context of both people is critical to defining that action, right? You know, the scholar doesn't do something just because he wants to. He does it because this is the situation and he's doing the thing that's best. Well, here, Fiori's not talking about the enemy, what the enemy's doing. He's just talking about what you're doing. So he says, it can deliver strong underhanded thrusts all the way to the opponent's face without stepping. Okay, that seems like a very sort of stabile thing, right? And then it then comes back down with the fendente to the arms and sometimes it can deliver a thrust, you know, straight up and quickly stand the foot, recover back down with a fendente to the head and arms, and then come back up again. You know, you know, picturing a boar that's, you know, thrusting its tusk up and bringing it down, thrusting its tusk up again, right? That's kind of the picture he's painting. Is he trying to say, you know, that you can do this regardless of what the, how the opponent responds? I say not. I say that it's common sense to moderate your actions depending on the response of the enemy, right? So if they responded specifically to allow you to do this word for word, then great. But I don't think that's what Fury is getting at here. I think he's just giving us a flavor, giving us a theme. He's painting a picture for us and the boar imagery couldn't be more clear. So here's a, you know, here's a poster. It can do things like what the boar does. Here is an image of some things that it's capable of. Keep that in your mind. And also it can defend well against the close play. So as, as to what this means, I'm actually not exactly sure what this means. If I had to guess, no, I couldn't guess. This either means it can enter the close play well or it means it can prevent the close play well. <laughs> and uh, I, I suspect it's the, the, the latter rather than the former because posters that um, facilitate left-hand entries tend to be the ones that are superior in the close play because the left hand is what's gonna be the primary, uh, the primary thing that's going to enter. And since Boar's Tooth is on the right, the left hand is kind of cocked back here and if you were to enter in directly with your left hand, you might be crossing yourself a bit. So it doesn't seem to me to be particularly conducive to the close play in terms of the strato plays that we're going to see. Anyway. But it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great Largo play. 
right? A boar's tooth is fantastic in Joco Largo, and Largo can, you know, good Largo can prevent or discourage entries to Strato. So that's my suspicion as to what it means. Yes, Bruce. Uh, well, you posted on in the talk section mm -hmm. of your scholar test, yeah. mm -hmm. and in the scholar test, you were demonstrating close plays. Mm -hmm. Person on whom you were demonstrating was definitely not holding their sword in anything like this position. They okay. had it out in front. Okay, kind of like kind of like near if the. If they had been, mm -hmm. if they had been back in Boar's Tooth. Mm -hmm. And it would be nearly impossible, I'm thinking, to set up a close play unless you get their sword out where you can close with it and make sure the point is far away. Well, what, what I mean is well, I've never seen anybody mm -hmm. in that position and somebody else actually get them close. Well, uh, I mean, you get, you well, get, now we're talking. I've seen uh, people get close. Sorry, go ahead, Bruce. Mm -hmm. Well, and. Uh, what I mean is, somebody who adopts this mm -hmm. is not likely to be attacked with a close play, because they can. Get, it it seems to be to be mutable to be able to get uh, to avoid it. Whereas people who have, uh, when they've just finished delivering a strike, they're no longer in Dante Tingaro. They are now in one of the forward positions, and from there they become vulnerable to. A potential counterattack and a close play and a close play or a grappling play. Okay, so what I hear you saying there is you're 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 suggesting that maybe one of the reasons why it defends against close play well is because it's withdrawn. Exactly. It's it's just it right. doesn't really defend against it. It prevents you from yeah, attacking in that way. Well, um, uh, right. Okay. So that is that is a very interesting idea. Um, when we get to uh, Largo and Stretto, we're definitely going to revisit these ideas. And I, so, one of the one of the curious um, one of the curious sort of paradoxes of our uh, our examination of Fiore here in this course is that we're in the sword and two hand section. We're talking about you know Largo and Stretto, but we haven't got there. We're going through all the posters, and we're we're necessarily imagining plays that are happening, but we haven't really got a flavor of what Fiore is talking about when he does Largo and Stretto. Though we did in, in one of the last classes, I did take some time to try and define Largo and Stretto. Um, well, so what you're saying, Bruce, is that, you know, maybe, maybe what Fiore is saying as well, you know, because, um, like I said a, a, f a few minutes ago, because the withdrawn posters uh, require a significant provocation and it, or attack to bring them out. You know, uh, and, and until they're brought out, they have all that potential to leap out and be dangerous. You're not just going to rush into Strato on somebody who's in a withdrawn posta. And in, in, no, in, 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 in uh, that and way, you're preventing close play. <clears throat> yeah? Yes. And, and another thought that occurred mm. to me, having observed people fighting mm. over the past while, is that frequently if somebody does start to go in to try and do a close play mm. and they're not quite close enough to pull it off, mm -hmm. the person on whom this close grapple is being used whips their arms back out of the way, it ends up very close to or in a position like the Dijingara. They, they pull their arms back to the side. So if you yeah. are reaching with your left hand to grab my right hand, the easiest way for me to get my right hand away from your grapple is to pull it down into my left. Well, it, it's hard to talk um, talk about something or about these things too specifically, especially on on the internet, um, uh, right? We're you know we're kind kind of limited to talk about broad you know uh, broader concepts here, um, but I do think your initial observation is um, is is near the mark that one of the things that these withdrawn posters allow is they they store up the potential for you know uh for you know for great defenses of good blows and they withdraw the sword a bit so that the enemy really has to come to you the the thing is though is that regardless of what posta you're holding it's perfectly possible to provocate you out of it and to get contact right that's what the that's what the attacker's job is 
and um, that's what they'll do if they know what they're doing. So regardless of what post you're, you're holding, it doesn't matter how much potential is incumbent in it, a good provocation will draw that sword out. And then what defines whether or not you're in a close play or not is going to be that engagement. What happens? So there's no post in and of itself that can guarantee, you know, that can, you know, keep you from Stretto or keep you in Largo or vice versa. It all depends on the engagements that come uh, from the two of uh, the two fighters. But um, the, the broad observation, I think, uh, Bruce, I think that I agree with that, which is that the withdrawn post is have great Largo actions incumbent in them and therefore uh, allow the person who's holding them to react effectively at Largo and therefore keep things at Largo if they can, right? Um, we, we will talk about this again, like I said, when we get to Largo and Stretto, um, but it's important to remember that uh, oftentimes we have no choice as, to, uh, as a fighter as to whether we're in Largo or Stretto. We can have these forced upon us by decisions of our enemy, right? And that's that's why we need to be expert at both, right? We can't afford to not be expert at both because at any moment we could have to deal with one or the other. You know, if we if we could reasonably by if we could learn a strategy that could reasonably guarantee that we could stay in Largo or stay in Stretto, then we'd have very sharp differences between fighters. We have fighters that could get Strato all the time and fighters that could keep Largo all the time. But of course, that isn't true, it's not possible. And you can see that anytime you see a fighter that likes Largo fight a fighter that likes Strato. <laughs> then both people end up being forced to do the things that they don't like, which is exactly what, what fencing is like, right? So um, yeah, but again, we'll review that more when we get to, um, when we get to Largo. But yeah, Boar's Tooth, it's a great play. Uh, it's a great post. Uh, it's a staple for um, uh, for deflections from underneath. Um, the, the the true edge um, oblique deflections from underneath are amazing against uh, all Fendentes and uh, Mendritos. So we haven't really looked at the cuts yet, uh, although we've sort of briefly talked about it. But um, the the cuts from uh, from above, the Fendenti cuts, and the um, the men the Mezzani cuts uh, from both sides can be excellently beaten or oh, oh, excuse me obliqued by the Tijin Gano on the right sorry on the left right this can deal with all of those angles on both right and left so it's a fantastic post um, all right uh, and it's Stabile <clears throat> moving on Kodalonga. 24 VA. Uh, BD, would you like to give us a go? This is the posta de Cora Longa, long tail guard, extended backward to the ground. It can thrust forward, parry, and strike. If it passes forward with the Fendente, it enters into close play without fail. This guard is good for waiting since it is easy to shift from this one to the others. Uh, BD. Oh no, more evidence for me. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pete. Excellent. Um, 24 VA, Posta di Coda Longa. All right, so this is a cool one uh, because I think this starts to show a bit of Fiori stylistic preference. Um, it, it's my view that Fiori likes the, um, he likes the withdrawn guards. Uh, not least because a, a lot of the guards he shows are withdrawn, but um, you know I just uh, looking at the text and looking at kind of how he approaches the place, I just get the sense that he he likes these withdrawn guards um, where the point is back or it's low um, or it's the point's not in your face like the later Italians like it, and um, a Cota Lunga is an excellent example of such a thing because why. Why is this here? Why even bother, right? What's the difference between Cota Lunga and Full Iron Gate? Um, where's Full Iron Gate? Here we go, the very first one. I'm gonna get lost in my tabs in a minute. So Full Iron Gate, relying on the right, 
It's a stabile posta. It's oh, it's pulsativa even. Super solid. Fiori says all these glowing things about it. It can parry pass, come to the come to the close. It can exchange thrust. Right? It can beat thrust. It can do everything. It can uh, it can attack, defend without much effort against anyone picking a fight with it. So here it is. So why do that? Right? It's a perfectly valid question. Why would Fury show a guard like that? Well, maybe it has some, it has something to do with the nature of the guard here and how he's holding it, right? The difference between a guard that's held like this at the hips, similar to what Boar's Tooth was held, similar to Breve, but of course that's point forward, and what about this guy, right? So the difference it seems to be, or it seems to me rather, to be in the kind of provocation that it prevents or that it uh, presents along with you know i suppose along with the potential deception of the length of the sword right um any you know, trained swordsman is going to develop early a sense of sword space so that you know given the height of the person and the length of the sword and the length of your sword you don't need to see that sword in Posta Longa to know where his sword is in Posta Longa, right? You don't need him to hold the bloody thing there for you to know where it is in time and space. You know where that sword is in space, even if it's not there. So, you know, this guy holding the sword back, he's not like he's playing a trick on you, you know? Yeah, sure, hold it back as much as you want. I still know where your space is, right? But I have to pay attention. I gotta pay attention. And I might not be paying full attention all the time. And especially if I'm not really cognizant of that space, if I'm not, uh, you know, if, if I'm not really good at judging that space, this could be a very excellent tactical decision, right, by the scholar to not only have the sword withdrawn, which does, you know, change the spacing a little bit, you know, it makes it a little more difficult to guess, but to withdraw the sword completely so the enemy over here has to pay attention to maintain that the reality of that space because that, that sword could come from, from here to post along in an eye flash, right? If the this guy knows his transitions. So he has to pay attention to that, otherwise he might lose it. And if he loses track of where this sword is, then that allows this scholar to, uh, it, 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 has a, it gives him a big advantage. He can creep distance on the enemy or he could also make the enemy feel like they're farther away from the sword than they really are, and um, great defenses can come from this, right? Um, you know, the same kinds of defenses, in my view, can come from uh, that can come from full iron gate, can come from uh, this one, right? He says it's stabile, right? Um, you know, I I I guess I agree only insofar as you know. In order to make the pulsativa actions, you would probably transition to full iron gate and then make the pulsativa, uh, pulsativa actions. So, you know, fine. Okay, this is stabile, but it's really interesting that it's held all the way back. It's a very provocative uh, way to stand, and and also note that he's not refused in this position. This is really important to note as well because you'd think that he might be refused in this position to kind of increase the level of provocation, right? But he's not refused here. And then by being not refused, his body posture is aggressive, right? That 60-40 position is aggressively forward weighted, right? But he's aggressively forward weighted and yet he's holding the sword back. So that's kind of, that's kind of a sweet deal for the enemy, right? If they were paying attention. But that's you know, he's, the body's still forward, but the sword's all the way back, maybe that's a great target to hit, right? So that's one note to make. The second note to make is that if he was refused, if he was, if he did have, make a volta stabile, then he would be here. <laughs> He'd be in Porto di Fiorimezzana, right? With a stabile, fighting this guy. So what does that tell us? Well, um, logic dictates that that tells us 
that um, using the footwork of the Volta Stabile, we could be in a multiple opponent situation and on one, you know, on one side of the 180 degree turn, we could be fighting in Porta de Fenomenzano, which is an amazingly stable guard and it's great. And on the other side, we're refused, or we're, 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 we're provocating rather, in Cota Lunga. And isn't that cool? Right? We can change that with a with a little Volta Stabile. So so very neat. Uh, a very neat. Um, all right, what else does it say? It can thrust forward, parry, strike. Yeah, yeah. If it passes forward with a Fendente, it enters close play without fail. So again, I, I read this as saying, you know, if it passes forward with a Fendente, it enters close, it's, it, um, it's great at entering close play, right? You know, again, in swordsmanship, everything depends on the reaction of the enemy, right? So it's hard to say things like without fail. However, if we understand these posta all as receiving attacks from the enemy, then this makes more sense. Because if we're receiving an attack from the enemy, the enemy is is realistically going to be passing forward, right? They're not just going to be increasing forward towards us. They're going to be passing forward towards us, right? With a with a with a step and a cut. And if they pass forward against us with a step and a cut, and you're in Cotalunga, and you, with a cut and a step, in that order of course, also pass forward you are by definition in, you're going to be in straddle. You're going to be in close play. Right? Um, uh, yeah. You're going to be in close play by the, by the classic definition of straddle. Okay? So, so that's, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, this guard is good for waiting. And since it's easy to shift from this one to others, well, <laughs> we just, we just saw yeah, there's the, there's our little uh, Volta Stabile uh, uh, fun little moving image there. Volta Stabile, Volta Stabile. Except when you Volta Stabile to the to the to the left, you lose your beard. Beard on the right, beard on the left. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so all of that seems to make sense. I think um, it's all pretty clear. Um, uh, at least as far as I've explained it in my mind <laughs> to myself. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about that? No? Um, th this is one that um, I always have to remind myself, as an aside, I always have to remind myself to try to do it more often because of our Sal's um, experience and, and uh, joy in um, I-33 and the Bolognese. Uh, our, uh, uh, I think I can say this collectively about Emma Sal's, um, well, many of us, let me be a little more uh, broad, many of us often fence in a very point forward way. Um, and uh, making sure that we remember these, these I'm going to say, stylistically Fiore guards, right? Making sure we remember to try and use these very provocative guards in our free play is, uh, I think, a good exercise. And not least, because if you watch any tournaments or any sort of ugh, mainstream HEMA, what kind of word does that even? What, what word does that even mean? Can you have a main? Can you have the mainstream of something that is impossibly niche? <laughs> That's like saying like you know mainstream, you know uh, mainstream pine cone collectors. <laughs> anyway, if you look at mainstream HEMA videos. Uh, the point backward guards are very seldom used. In fact, one of the most common guards used is uh, Ladonna La and Breve. Some some version of Breve. Right? Some kind of point forward guards. It's very, very common. And, and, and Ladonna. Um, and Posalonga, I guess, most obviously. But um, these backward guards, hardly ever used by people, uh, may be a very Fiori thing. All right, next. Speaking of rare guards, Bicorno. Folio 24VV. Uh, Bruce, 
Would you like to read us the text? Uh, this is the posta di bicono, which stays closed so that the point remains always on the center line. It can do that. It can do all that the posta longa can, which is also true of the finestra and the posta frontale. Okay, so we've already kind of seen finestra, um, so um, so there's that. Posta frontale we haven't seen yet, but we'll keep this in our in our mind. Um, it can do all that posta. Well, first of all, I'm getting I'm getting ahead of myself. Bicorno, what is this? Let's um, go to our family comparison here. All right, so here's um, here's posta bicorno in the four versions: um, the Getty, the PD, the Morgan, and the Paris. Um, what is it? Well, um, it's a weird one. All right, it's a weird one. When I say weird, what do I mean? So Bicorno appears to be posta longa. Let me get lost in my own tabs now. It appears to be posta longa withdrawn high. Okay. So if you were to withdraw posta longa to your chest, but not to breve, you would be in bicorno. Okay. So why bother, right? What's the what's the deal? Well, first of all, um, you know, at least breve guards aside, right? So um, when we look at Breve, um, and actually this is a, I'm going to be a bit snooty here for a second, but I'm going to do it anyway. So the way this is drawn, it seems as if in this picture, Posta Breve is being adopted in third position. So when you're holding the sword, your uh, thumb is facing 12 o'clock. Okay, the true edge is facing six o'clock. That's what it seems like it's drawn like. But this cannot be. This cannot be because Breve in third position is utterly useless. It guards nothing. It doesn't even exclude a side. So what do we mean by excluding a side? So when you when your sword is in front of you right the sword has edge has or the, the sword has two edges true edge or false edge because of the way you're holding the sword you are broadly speaking able to resist force on the true edge and not on the false broadly speaking so the side that your true edge is facing is the side broadly speaking that you're said to be excluding right now usually when you're in a point forward post up the point of your sword is drifting in the middle right so the point is in the is on your center line if you were to draw a line straight down and bisect your body the point of the sword is going to be on your center line but your hands are going to be regardless of whether or not you're in frontale or breve or whatever your hands are going to be roughly aligned to your hips and shoulders and so there's going to be a slope from where your hands begin to where the sword ends at the point. And where the true edge is facing, the line that the true edge is facing is said to be the line that the true edge is excluding, right? So if you're in breve on the right, your true edge is going to be facing, you know, roughly say, you know, four o'clock on the clock, right? If you're in prime position, where your, um, your thumb is facing down at six o'clock, your true edge is gonna be at 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock maybe, right? If you're in third position, then your true edge is excluding the six o'clock angle. And if you're in fourth position, your true edge can exclude anywhere from, mm, anywhere from seven o'clock to 11 o'clock, depending on how you form it. Fourth, uh, fourth position, is very uh, changeable. 
But Breve in third position excludes nothing. And Postalonga in, in third position also excludes nothing, right? Which is why it's very, um, which is why it's very mutable, right? But at least Breve in fourth and second exclude at least one side, right? Breve, a, a, a Breve held in uh, in second position on the on the right hip excludes roughly speaking the low to middle right side and on the left hip it excludes the low to middle left side and that has some utility right if someone were to give you a mezzano on the side that you're holding a breve you barely have to move the sword to receive it right because the side is already basically closed right and same you know same with on, uh, with on fourth so um, though the picture is drawn this way, a very common interpretation of Breve, not least an interpretation which aligns with every other later Italian source, is that when you're holding these short guards, the, so the, the true edge is turned to second position or fourth position. It's excluding the right side or the left side. Okay? Why, do, why did I go on about that? Bicorno is like Postalonga in that it is, well, it is either interpreted to be held in first position or third position. So just like Postalonga, it excludes nothing, right? But even worse than Postalonga, it has absolutely no structural, uh, no structural capacity, right? At least Postalonga, you know, I say it excludes nothing. It, it excludes the, th you know, it excludes the the, the six o'clock angle, sure, right? Sure it does. You know, usually when you're going to insist that angle, right, if you're in contact with someone's sword and you're in third position and you're going to insist that angle, usually you do that post-engagement, right? You've already touched their sword, you know where it is, and you find that the position is, is such that you can insist this third position and, or this, you know, you can insist in third and, 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 and thrust your enemy in Alton, and that's great. But Bicorno doesn't even it doesn't have a structural stability like postalonga right this is this is fairly you know this sword is connected to your body you can put it through someone it's it's got some you know it's got some structural stability behind it in terms of resisting force and delivering force bicorno has none your arms are all fucked up right they're they're, they're bent the sword is in so if there was ever a poster that could be said that you're not going to receive blows in this poster, it's this one. I think no doubt. However, this isn't necessarily an issue because, of course, he says that it's instabile. And our, um, uh, our instinct, I would imagine, on seeing a position like this, would be to say, well, okay, it doesn't seem to have structural stability, but it's still pulling forward and in the middle. And because it's not guarding anything, it's necessarily provoking everything. So it's a point, uh, it's a point in the middle that's high, and it's not excluding either the le left or right side. So it's kind of saying, all right, attack me. But because it's in the middle, it's still significantly extended compared to the posters that are point back, compared to La Donna, compared to uh, even uh, Tutto Porta di Ferro, certainly compared to Cordelunga. So it's already very extended. So surely, Bicorno is gonna be able to react very quickly to anything that's given. And not only that, but it's gonna be able to react in a way that's going to prosecute the best things about Postalonga. Specifically that Postalonga is extended, it's point forward, it's full of deceit, right? So what the hell is going on here? It seems like a kind of a weird place. But if we read instabile as meaning mutable, then there's really not that, there's really not that big of a mystery. This is a poster that clearly provokes certain uh, attacks, certain lines, right? but it's point forward, so it's very quick to the reaction, and you know for a thousand percent that it's not a poster you're going to hold. Rather, you're not gonna receive attacks in it, you're going to change and deceive in it. And you're also, you also know that because it's point forward, 
it can be uh, it's easier to for the enemy to gain registration on this sword than it is a lot of other posta so you have to be very aware so when you're holding this posta which is a posta again that's point forward but doesn't even have the structural capacity of posta longa when you're holding this posta you're saying let's play right this is a deceitful guard if there ever was one right I, I you know i don't know if unicorns are particularly deceitful creatures in uh in legend or i mean oh i just made the mistake it's not the we call it unicorn but it's called beacorn though the two-horned guard technically right i don't know why we keep calling it unicorn but anyways this guard uh, uh stands it stands to reason that this guard is full of deceit we're already aware of what it can do because the text says it can do everything post along that can do and what it's good at and what it sucks at should fit our intuition based on what it looks like does that make sense this is another one that is un um, it's uncommon in other sword arts although others um, other sword arts and manuals have analogs to it um, but a high withdrawn point forward guard is, uh, yeah, it's, un it's uncommon. Um, so it's cool. It's another really kind of cool Fiore-esque uh, thing, right? Um, that's, that, that's pretty neat. And it's also one to, um, it's also one to try, right? This is another one that uh, uh, I know I tried working in whenever I remember, but I often don't remember. So guards like uh, Kodalunga and uh, Bikorno, though, they're, they're neat to work in. And uh, actually, especially if you have an offhand, like a buckler or a shield, right? Sword and shield, this you can, you can adopt be, uh, be corno with a sword and shield. Um, it's actually a really, really neat, neat poster to play with. Um, and so, um, so yeah, yeah, don't forget about this guy, right? It's not conventional, but it's really neat. Um, Aaron, I just have a question. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've seen videos by the Exiles, I think, mm -hmm. and maybe some other people that say that it's uh, that Bicorno is really strong in the bind, and that it could be advantageous to switch to it um, after you've made contact. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, I don't Excellent know how question. how how realistic that is because I haven't been able to put a sword against a sword since I saw that. But <laughs> right. <laughs> so your were. Um, that's a great question. So strong in the bind. So um, I'm really glad you asked that question. So there's a difference between being good in the bind and strong in the bind. So you you could have a you could have a posta that you as a fencer favor adopting once an engagement has taken place because you think it's really great at presenting you options, right? So you know uh, figuring out that problem, uh, you know making the opponent make decisions and giving you opportunities and things like that. And insofar as you find success with it, you find that it's a very strong position to adopt in the bind, if you get my meaning. The other sense of that, being strong in the bind, is a position, a post at which is um, able to uh, present some structural resistance and stability after two swords have begun an engagement after two swords have touched each other yeah and i believe that's what they're saying okay so in that sense i would definitely be confused because of the description that i gave you this is not a position which appears to present the kind of stru uh, uh, structural uh you know resoluteness that some of these other posters do so, you know, um, uh, what's, you know, uh, uh, Finestra, I would say, is not, I, I would say it's not strong in the bind. Um, you know, uh, Breve, I would say, is not strong in the bind. You know, usually when you're in the bind and there's strength needed, usually that's done in the form of posta longa, right? usually when your when your swords are touching and you have to either insist a position or resist the force of another person usually you're doing this in posta longa in one of the four hand positions right first second third fourth 
if you're changing, right, if you're in an engagement, but you have to change your posta, your position, you're going to be rolling through any number of posta, right? Finestra, um, uh, Bicorno, maybe, maybe even Breve, you know, Frontale, you know, who knows, right? But if you're if you're resisting force or insisting your own position after you've engaged someone, Bicono doesn't seem to me to be a post that can do that as well as others. That's about as charitable as I as I can be about about that. I think I've watched an Exiles video and um, yeah, I mean you know that's my view. But it's an it's an interesting notion. Um, and as an aside, I think one of the sources for the belief that there is some stability potentially in Bicorno um, are the German manuscripts. So if we look at um, the family comparison again, some of these pictures in the family comparison are particularly, well, some of them, <laughs> all of these except for the Getty are very similar to some uh, positions that you'll see in German manuscripts where you know this um, the hand has shifted significantly to the pummel and the sword will be plunged into a position into an engagement um, you know a possibly starting with contact right so someone's given a blow you've connected there's a bit of a bind and you're shifting into this position to to um, plunge this sword through and, uh, and, and obviously, in so doing, you're insisting the sword into the engagement, right? You're not avoiding contact. You're, you're insisting your sword into it, and you're, you're doing it through sort of this Bicono position, which is probably going to end up in some kind of thrust and prime or something like that, right? Um, so maybe insofar as that kind of thing is concerned, maybe there's some stability incumbent in it there. But in terms of you know being in engagement and resisting force, you know it's not the poster that I would I would think of. If I would, if I was in that position, I would immediately switch to uh, uh, post the longer. If that, if that were me. But it's important to know other people have different opinions, right? So th um, thank you very much for bringing that up, uh, uh, Graham. Uh, and Thanks, yeah. sir. Yeah. Um, anything else? Any other questions about Bicorno? The mystical poster. Uh, BD here. Yes. Just to uh, just to build on to that last conversation in the Exiles video that I saw, they were coming to the contact out to Longa and then yielding back or collecting back to Bicorno. So, bringing the blade engagement from closer to the strong to closer to the weak. Okay. And then from there, being able to use sensitivity to either step to the right and thrust back out to Longa, or if there's pressure going around to the left, basically doing second play. I'm not comfortable with using bicornal like that, but it's interesting to see how they're using that in sure. a way that uh, we're more more likely to use uh, Finestra, right? Right, exactly. So, and, and that's why, so when I said, you know, in the sense of, you know, strong in the bind, right? Um, what you described to me, BD, sounds more like, say, someone describing a tactical affinity for using bicornal to solve problems that result in, uh, uh, that begin with binds. Right, so you're in a bind. What do you do? Well, maybe if I shift to Picorno and I get a, you know, I shift the blade engagement to the weak, and I can move around and I can do things. That's like a, that's a, a tactical flavor that could be per perfectly useful and valid for all I know. You know, someone could favor it, and it could be really unique and interesting, an intuitive or a, a, a innovative use of Picorno in a way that kind of jumps the mainstream, whatever that means. Right. So sure, you know, why not? Right. A second point from observation is how easy and quick it is to change from Bicorno to Breve or Frontale or to cut a Fendente or to go to a thrust. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Which ties into your concept that we've discussed previously about mm -hmm. being able to do all cuts or thrusts from this posta by transitioning first to another posta. Right, right, which is which is something that I've um, I have mentioned briefly before. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think, as Fiore students, one of the things that we're aiming for uh, is uh, is effortless and 
um, very, very quick post to transitions. So, you know, one of the, it's not the most hated drill in the Emma Corpus, but I'm sure it's the drill that glosses people's eyes over first is our posted to posted drill. <laughs> we grind that, that son of a bitch constantly forever, right? And, you know, the, it is boring. That's true. And there are things we, we can do and should do to spice it up, et cetera, et cetera. But at its core, what it's getting at is it's getting these posted transitions to be unconscious for you. So that if you want to do a thing, your hands transition to the poster that's most conducive to do that thing. Or you, you, you want to do a thing and you know how to do it from all these different posters and, and that therefore can build in some really innovative tactical uh, tricks and, and, and plays uh, from there. So uh, like I've said before, if I had to distill all of Fury's system down to one thing, it would be posted transitions. Uh, I, I, I still think that's, uh, that, that's true. So yeah. Yeah, Picorno. Picorno's cool. I have to stop calling it Unicorn. But I uh, feel like I, uh, I won't. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on. Uh, Folio 24 VC. Aposta Frontale Dita Corona. Can we have uh, Connor? Please and thank you, sir. Uh, sorry, first edition or second edition? Whichever you wish. This is the Posta Frontale, which some masters call the Guard of the Crown. This is good for crossing the opponent's sword, as well as against thrusts. Against a high thrust, cross the opponent's blade while passing offline. Against a low thrust, also pass offline, beating the thrust to the ground. You can also operate this way. Against a thrust, pass back while delivering a fendente to the head and arms down to Dente di Cingaro. Then immediately deliver one or two thrusts with an accrescimento of the front foot, finished with a fendente that gets you back in that guard. Awesome. Thank you very much, Connor. Okay, so lots there, right? Posta frontale. Um, all right. So um, first things first, uh, Posta Pantale is drawn more usefully to us than Breve. Um, Posta Pantale is much more obviously uh, sided than uh, Breve was. So Breve was drawn, was drawn in third. Um, oh, wait, let me back up. One, one more thing about, about uh, Bicorno. Um, how we form this Posta in Emma Toronto has definitely gone through some evolution over time. We used to form it with the true edge up, but over the last couple of years, we've we've um, <laughs> the formal curriculum has been to form it with the true edge down in third position. So all that is to say is that there is some variation among the sales. I believe I don't know. Do you guys in Guelph do a true edge up? Uh, BD? We're, uh, we're now true edge down. You're not true edge down. So okay. right, right. right knuckle down and then yeah. left thumb back as per the Getty. Yeah. So, um, okay, so you guys are true edge down now. But there, there is some variation uh, to, to this. I, through most of my time at Emma, I've done a true edge up, and it's still the one that I'm most comfortable with, but it's quite possible that's just due to experience and just me training the thing for, you know, a long time before we changed it over but there's no real i don't think there's any big difference between the two maybe someone would argue I, but uh yeah i yeah i disagree okay there you go <laughs> not, <laughs> great just just in in brief if i may yeah please um, yeah so i was trained that true edge down is, is getty uh, true edge up is Pisani dossi personally i prefer true edge up okay but in, uh, in guelph we do it to true edge down as directed by our provost uh, mm. david murphy mm. and to be consistent with the getty and the reason why I disagree, this may be uh, minor, so I'll keep it brief, is mm -hmm. the way that the weapon unwinds as you go to breve, breve, yes. Uh, yes. frontale, frontale, or into the, the thrust. So with the true edge up, you get more of an unwind to the right, so more of a snap. I, I actually agree. That's part of why I'm more, still more comfortable with it. Uh, I wouldn't die on that hill, but uh, um, going when you're true edge up, going to frontale seems 
Uh, sorry, going to uh, Finestra seems a little more, well, logical. Then uh, you also get yeah. more of a snap on a, fin a right fendente. Yes, yes, you do. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so debatably it, a bit a, slower no. though. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Oh, debatably a bit slower though. Yeah. Well, you know, the the point being here that um, you know it's important for us to remember to to know where there is variation in opinion because that's important. Uh, that's an important indicator of the subject matter, and in this particular case, uh, there's some variation in whether to hold um, a B call of no true edge up or true edge down. So isn't that interesting? All right, um, didn't want to didn't want to forget to add that. Okay, so frontale, frontale, 24 VC. So um, unlike Breve, um, this is drawn sided. Um, this image appears to be drawn in uh, fourth position, right, or rather. In frontale, excluding the high to middle line to the left, um, so the true edge is going to be this true edge is like at a six o'clock angle. Wait, yeah, that's six, six o'clock angle. Uh, sorry, uh, I lied to you. An eight o'clock angle. I have that clock in my house. All right. Um, yeah, and so so the other the other frontale would be. Um, not aligned to the left shoulder, but over here aligned to the right shoulder and with true edge facing to the right, excluding uh, the right at about a four o'clock angle, right? And this, the point is sloping uh, to just past the center line, like all um, uh, of these uh, point forward guards here. Um, when I teach in class, I like to describe frontale and breve like the four corners of a square based pyramid so if your two shoulders and your two hips are each corner then both breves and both frontales are you know more or less aligned to those points although of course the breves are actually touching them and the frontales are not the frontales are roughly you know straight out from the shoulder same same height, same level, but they're roughly straight out from the shoulder. But those two um, form sort of the, the the sloping sides of a square based pyramid, and then uh, posta longa. Well, and they all kind of slope towards the center, and of course posta longa also uh, fills uh, fits in there as well. And that's kind of your cone of defense, kind of paints a picture of this cone of defense in front of you. That when you're holding your guard or your sword point forward, it's going to tend to occupy one of those positions along this this cone of defense. Um, yeah, so um, frontale is on that cone. Um, it's good for crossing the opponent's sword. Um, reading, crossing as in getting in contact with, engaging your opponent's sword, and he says it's also good against against thrusts. So we're going to return to this in a second. First of all, it's good for crossing the opponent's sword. So one of the one of the principal problems with our typical use of frontale are no, let me put it this way. The a, a common use of frontale is as a holy shit guard. Okay? So, we, you know, most blows tend to come from high, right? That's just the nature of human beings. Most blows tend to be shoulder height or head height or whatever. And frontale, especially if you're lying low, frontale, all it is is you're rising your hands up with the sword point high, you know, you're covering a whole entire line, either left or right, you're raising the sword up and you're putting your sword between yourself and the enemy's sword and clang. You make the block, you make the defense, whatever. And it, and it can function like that, right? In a pitch, it can definitely function as a holy shit guard. However, that's not its real nature. It's not its nature. Its nature is instabile. And this is important to understand with frontality. Though it can catch blows, it's meant to touch blows. That's what it's meant to do. So when you receive blows from high, 
by deploying Prontale point first with the, um, the, the weak leading the strong, seeking contact with the weak of the sword, Frontale can give you very early registration on an attack. And it can allow you precious passing moments to react and present an effective defense. So, you know, the problem with holy shit defenses, the problem with blocks is that they don't slow down the attacker at all. They don't change the tempo. The leader stays the leader. But with a subtle use of frontale, with an advanced use of frontale, the defender can gain early registration and allow them to change and to shift into other other guards like um, like uh, finestra, very commonly, right? An extended finestra, or or maybe an extended long in one of the other hand hand positions, or you know whatever. It can provide early registration and allow a tactical shift that can change the result of which can change the the tempo entirely, right? While also providing a potential holy shit defense if you were to fuck that uh, all those calculations up. So that's really, really useful, right? It allows fencers to attempt to use the posta subtly while allowing a little bit of, you know, uh, bumper room for failures and judgment. And, and that makes it pretty damn valuable, right? There's not a, there's not a lot of other posts that can say that they can do that. Um, so so Frontale is definitely one of the most common and important posts in our repertoire, not least because um, it is extended and it guards a whole entire side. So all the all of the posts that are extended are going to be the posts that you're gonna um, you're going to uh, encounter post engagement. Right? You're going to most commonly encounter post-engagement. post longa, um, extended finestras, um, and, and extended frontales are like the bread and butter of, uh, of uh, sword combinations, right? Um, both giving and receiving. Big sword combinations, one, two, three, four blows in a row in post longa. Uh, sorry, in, uh, in, in Jaco Largo. Okay? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what we're looking at here with um, Postal Frontale. Uh, it can, it's best deployed high and out, extended from your head, right? Deployed very close to your head, it's can be kind of dangerous, right? So it's kind of similar to Postal Longa in that respect. But it does tend to exclude the middle to high lines on both sides. And you're usually going to use, well, I guess frontale only really exists in fourth and second position, right? There's no real frontale in third position or in prime. So it's going to tend to exclude both the high left and the high right side, or maybe extending to the low, uh, the, the, the middle to high sides, depending on if you lower your hands a little bit. Okay? Um, so, uh, yeah. So that's frontale something else to say oh yes thrusts he did but he doesn't talk about this shit at all in the text <laughs> this, this is he just kind of it's good for crossing the opponent's sword okay great and now he's talking about thrusts <sighs> against a high thrust cross the opponent's blade while passing off line against a low thrust also pass off line and beat the sword to the ground how do you defend a low thrust again uh, with frontale That seems crazy. Let's read on. Um, against a thrust, just generic, pass backwards, well that's interesting, while delivering a fendente to the head and arms, and then immediately follow up with a couple thrusts of your own, and then finish with a fendente that gets you back to Dentity Chingaro. So, all right, what's the deal with this? Defense against thrusts. So, very briefly, it's my view 
that we ought not read this as defending against thrusts while, while in frontale. Because that seems a little weird. It's my view that what he means by defending against thrusts is that especially when you're in low guards, a transition to posta frontale can pick up thrusts that can be both low to high. A transition to frontale can pick up a high thrust, and a transition from low to high can pick up a low thrust, right? And a low thrust, again, is a thrust that's going to come down around your midsection. They're going to tend not to be too much lower than that, right? Maybe you're growing at the most. You know. Although thrusting me in the nuts all the time, notwithstanding. Um, <laughs> they're going to tend to pick them up as you transition from low to high, as opposed to being in frontale and then receiving thrusts. I don't think that's the intuitive way to read that text there. So in the transition of frontale, using this posta, it can pick up thrusts and give you things to do against them, and that's that's great. Insofar as that's concerned, that's great. And that's kind of what he's uh, what he's talking about. And he gives us a play that we can use against the thrust that involves some transitions to, you know, some some. Uh, some attacks and transitions to then to the Chingaro, and isn't that cool? So yeah, Frontale. Any questions, comments? Okay. So transitioning so, through Frontale, either from a high posta to a low posta breaking to the ground, or from a low posta to a high posta setting it to the side. Yeah. So and so a transition from another posta, what, so yeah, what I'm talking about is, it, um, specifically when he's talking about defending thrusts, I'm suggesting that the way to read that, or rather a way to read that, might be that from another posta, a transition to frontale that picks that thrust up. And then once you've made the engagement in posta frontale, once you've picked the thrust up, then you can react and do the the, the best thing to it, break it down, uh, you know, whatever, expel it, do do whatever. So yeah, that's what this I'm This ties into just... another conversation we've had, where yeah. from the current conversation, the idea of using the posters uh, could be thought of as at the moment of blade contact, you're tra transitioning to or through that poster. Yeah, right, right. Which For also sure. ties back to what we were talking about with Bicorno. That's right, that's right. Um, uh, and, you know, Bicorno can become frontale in the, the flash of an eyelash. Um, you know, a frontale can become finestra in the flash of an eyelash. All of these can become post along in the flash of an eyelash. Like, these these transitions are very subtle, right? And these, the, definitely one of the most difficult parts of swordsmanship is not the actual defenses and attacks. That's pretty milk toast in comparison of difficulty. It's doing the right thing once the engagement is actually begun. Once the swords are actually in contact, sensing the energy, choosing the right thing that fits the context and the pressure and the drift of what's going on and the tempo, and your 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 enemy's style, you know, a style and what he's paying attention to and what he's ignoring. Choosing the right thing and doing it in a timely fashion, and then uh, changing away from it when that fails into another thing. Right away. Like that's so hard and that all comes from the bind you know and uh surely a key element of making all of that work uh is is uh, effective posted transitions right uh i would say and so you know seeing the similarities and differences between frontale bicorno uh, finestra posta longa uh, even even breve uh, you know uh, all of those point forward guards and things that seems really important to contextualizing what we can do once the swords are engaged, right? Once there's been a bind, and once the things are really kicking off. And we'll see lots of that, um, or we'll see more of that anyway, when we get to the to Lark Strato. And we'll see some concrete examples of plays. We won't have to, you know, talk uh, a little so uh, broadly. Um, did, did you have anything else to, to add there, BD? No, that's good. Okay. Um, awesome. Okay, so la I think we have the last one. Yeah. 
Perfect, and we're almost uh, done at 10 o'clock. Last post at 24VD. Uh, Graham, would you like to read this one for us? Sure. Uh, so, uh, this is the middle Dente de Gingado. There are two Dente de Gingado guards, the whole Dente de Gingado and the middle Dente de Gingado. This one is called middle because it is formed in the center of the body. What the other Dente de Gingado can do, this can do. And just like the boar strikes at an angle, from this guard the sword always strikes at an angle to the opponent's blade. From this guard, always attack with thrusts, uncover your opponent, mess up his hands, and sometimes his head and arms. <laughs> You're chuckling as you read that there. <laughs> yeah, Dente de Gingado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Say that six times fast. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, all right, Graham, thank you very much. Okay, so middle boar's tooth, as opposed to, let's bring up the other one, as opposed to, blah, 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 blah. regular boar's tooth. There's middle, there's regular, what's the deal? So, first of all, it seems as if the main difference between Dente di Cingaro here and boar's tooth here is that this posta has been formed refused okay so the hands are in the same place but from this position the scholar has um, done a volta stabile and is now here okay now there, there are other views to that. Actually, I think I've heard, I think I've heard others say that maybe the only difference between this one and this one is a kind of pulling back of the hip or something weird like that. But uh, you know, whatever. I don't want to talk about that. So let's just say, <laughs> very simply, for the sake of the argument, that this, uh, or for the sake of the uh, stream rather, that this is boar's tooth, and it's, uh, but. There's been a volta stabile and it's refused. So okay, Which if it's mm -hmm, look mm -hmm. more like volta stabile refused middle iron gate. Ye if we just went by the picture. Yeah, let's bring that up as well. Um, middle iron gate. Yeah, so here we go. We got middle iron gate, and let's imagine that we have refused here. And then we've got boar's tooth, and let's imagine we refused here, and we got Dente di Cingaro Messana. So, you know, I, I absolutely think they're they're extremely similar. What makes this clearly Dente di Cingaro Messana uh, to me is that the hands are still pulled back, as opposed to, you know, like, Ponte de Fenomenzana, the hands are actually extended, right? And if you were to refuse, I don't know why you would in this guard, but if you were to refuse, you'd still have the hands extended per se, right? Whereas in Boar's Tooth, they're drawn back specifically, and here they're still drawn back specifically, and you you refuse the position. Uh, but you know, they're all they're all very similar. They can become each other in the flash of an eyelash. So if this is very similar to Boar's Tooth, then we ought to intuitively assume that it can do everything that Boar's Tooth can do. And what the other <laughs> teaching Gato can do, this can do. So, <laughs> great. Our intuition is on track, right? What's the difference between these two? Fiori says, well, this is middle because it's in the middle of the body. All right. What the other can do, this can do. Okay. It's just like the boar. It strikes at an angle. Okay. In this guard, uh, in this guard, the sword always strikes at an angle to the opponents. So... This is interesting, his insistence of, this, of the sword striking at an angle to the opponents. I'm not really sure what this means. Because, you know, the angle that you... The angle that you that you uh, engage the, the enemy's sword can be varied from here. And can be varied from here, just as if it can be varied from here. So, to be totally honest, I don't really know what the... I don't see this, I don't understand the kind of a substantive difference between this posta and Boar's Tooth and, uh, and 
I'll put it to defend that's on. Right? It's this is the substantive difference seems to be beyond me. Unless this comment is actually not unique. Unless he's just saying something about Bohr's tooth. That the you know the bore strikes at an angle. See, there's some evidence. The bore strikes at an angle. Well, sure. And this guard, the you know, the sword always strikes at an angle to the opponents. Well, you know, when you're forming Bohr's tooth, the sword is usually not. Um, you know, the 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 sword, the tr the false edge of the sword, usually angles in a little bit, right? It, you know, and you can kind of see in the picture in the the depiction here, although you could you could read it as straight, but in this position, the sword kind of, the, the false edge kind of angles in a bit. So, you know, you you could you could read this as describing just Boar's Tooth in general, right? Rather than something about this positional shift has made some sort of unique angle to Middle Boar's Tooth that's different from the other Boar's Tooth. I don't think that's, that's, that's right, but, you know, again, do I really have any idea? No, I don't. From this guard, always attack with thrusts, uncover your opponent, mess up his hands, sometimes his head. So this is interesting because in the Boar's Tooth um, posta, he talks about Fendentes a lot, right? In the Boar's Tooth posta 24RD, he talks about you can um, thrust without stepping, but then come back with a Fendente to the arms, then deliver a thrust to his face and extend the front foot and come back with a Fendente. Right? And fendentes and thrusts are coming together here like peanut butter and jam. With here, he says, from this guard, always attack with thrusts. Does this conflict? Well, maybe, but maybe not. Because he's always attacking with thrusts here, too, isn't he? Right? He's attacking with a thrust and then and then following up with a fendente. So again, maybe Fury is just saying exactly what he said before. Right? strikes just like the boar it's at an angle well okay the other one was at an angle too so there's nothing really special about this one from this guard always attack with thrusts well boar's tooth always attacked with thrusts so fine uncover your opponent mess up his hands you're not going to do that with thrusts so maybe he means cuts there and sometimes his head and arms well head and arms he talks about doing a fendente to the head and arms here so maybe this is all just makes perfect sense Right, maybe he's just describing exactly what he does in Boar's Tooth here. And he's saying, look, this is middle Boar's Tooth. I'm showing it to you. It's refused. It can do everything that Dendi Chingaro can do. And if you were at all worried, let me reiterate everything. Strikes at an angle, you know. Um, uh, it always attacks with thrusts. Use it to uncover your opponent and hit him with fendentes. Fine. That's the that's the narrative I'm offering. Yep. B is also hiding his hands more. Yes, exactly. So you know, so uh, this begs the question, of course, why adopt this guard then? Right. What's the difference, really? Is there a difference? Well, you know, we could say yes and no. Is there a substantive difference in the options you have available? Probably not. Right. That that's what I would say. Probably not. But what has refusing the guard done for you well as exactly you're exactly right mark it seems to withdraw the hands even more right here you're aggressively weighted but you know you're still aggressive right when you're in an aggressive uh, posta uh, a posture while it's true that when you're aggressively weighted and your sword is low while it's true your high lines are available because you're aggressively postured you're visibly ready to strike and react to any threat to those high lines, right? You know, you're you're only inviting attacks to the high lines in so far as your sword is low. Your posture is saying, I'm ready to come right at you, right? Whereas when you're refused, you're visibly offering the ref the, the lines that you're that are open when you're refused. <coughs> <clears throat> you're visibly offering those lines in a much more substantial and, prov uh, and provocative way than you are when you're not refused. And, yeah, it looks like yeah. he's hiding his hands with the body. Right, exactly, exactly. And so maybe that, in this, in this context, maybe that has uh, a useful tactical uh, application to the engagement, right? 
and so that's that's a fantastic observation not negligible right right um, yeah he, it really it, it really is you know even more so than here it really is like he's kind of sucked the sword back well could also be yeah. mm -hmm. could also be that he's he looks like he's transitioning to code a longer <laughs> sure sure and you know someone like me would you know would say that you know all of these things uh, live in in transition so you know when would you use that teaching Garo um, Mezzana well if you were transitioning from say uh, Mezza Porta di Ferro and Cota Lunga and you had a tactical reason to to launch an attack from here right or you know you were trying to suck an opponent towards you right and you were in, say, an aggressive forward-weighted guard, you were in Breve, you were in Puente de Ferro Mazzana, and you were trying to suck them in, so you refused back. And your plan was to, to, to transition all the way to Cota Lunga, but because of something your opponent did, you stopped halfway in Bors 2. And here you are, because you refused. You know, so all of these things, these transitions, have a myriad of different tactical application, and they're gonna be based on, in a lot of ways, based on your preferences, how you choose to solve um, problems, things you're good at, things you suck at, and the things that the posts are good at and the things that the posts suck at, right? Your choices are gonna vary depending on all of those things. And uh, yeah, and your, and your experience, yeah, so. But it's cool to know that it's there, right? Um, you know, uh, just because, you know, just saying this post can do everything Boris Tooth can do doesn't mean that there's no point in ever looking at this poster, right? Doesn't mean that we don't care, right? And, you know, your observation mark that this is really sucked back the hands and kind of hiding the sword, that um, that can be very important uh, tactically, right? It, 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 it could be seen as doing something very similar to Kodalunga on the right, okay? And this is something actually that we should bring up before we close that um, with a sword in two hands at least conventionally speaking there's no Kota Lunga on the left with a sword in two hands right now at Emma we like to say that this is you know the long tail on the right and the long tail on the left is this guy but you'll notice that the sword you know the, the second hand is off the sword now of course this is the same sword so we could we use this you know we, we could be in left tail right or we could be in Kodalunga on the right where did I put it I'm lost in my own taps there we go so we could be in left tail or we could be in Kodalunga on the right but if we're, we have two hands on the sword and we don't want to change that handedness, but we still want to provoke significantly, keeping our right foot forward, suck that sword back, really offer our shoulder, then Dente teaching Karo Matsana is a perfect poster for it, right? The hands are effectively in the same place as this, right? The difference is that this pommel is going to swap around to where the elbow is, right? If you were going to adopt this post, right? The pommel would pop over, and of course, this hand would let it go. So isn't that neat? Um, okay, so it is 10.09. Um, uh, we're right near the end. Uh, Andrew, Abidi, and Connor, do you have anything to add or subtract this evening? Andrew, Connor, no, would nothing. you like to go first? Nothing for me, no. No? Okay. Uh, BD? Yes. So just to build on your last comments, mm -hmm. the in the mounted section, the sword and left hand, uh, the left tail, and the Denti Jichangaro, mm -hmm. in my opinion, are treated similarly. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we look here at this last poster where it's refused, mm -hmm. right, well... We've got left tail refused, and we've got Denti Dijangaro 
refuse. Both of them are provocative, both of them right. are coiled, sprung, ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could argue, sure, there's, there's differences in true edge engagement versus false edge engagement, but you could argue they are possibly equivalent. Sure, I mean, you know, there's nothing preventing you necessarily from giving a false edge engagement from here, right? It's certainly conducive to a true more than a false. And in 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 in, in uh, Dente, Dente di Cingaro Mezzana, it's more conducive to a false and a true, but it doesn't necessarily prevent you from doing it. It depends on how, what, how much time you have to transition, I, I would say. So I, I agree a thousand percent, yeah. In fact, you could argue part of the part of a deceptive nature would be uh, people thinking you're going to use a false edge and you can use the true edge. Absolutely, absolutely, right? Absolutely. And that's another and thing, I, I think that's a that's another advanced concept for deception for for us. Not only are there posters that are by nature deceptive, but the mere act of timely transitions of posta can also be extremely deceptive. You know, if 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 you if you can see your opponent say holding a guard, that you know you know the best posta to defend against it. You know you know posta that you're super comfortable with, right? And they're a good distance away. You could tactically decide to adopt a posta that is weak against this guard to draw an attack, and then as the attack's coming, switch to the posta that's strong and present the defense. You know the tactical uh, applications are endless, right? But all of these posta transitions uh, ha- can be deceptive for sure, right? On top of the deceptions that are presented by the actual posters themselves. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, sorry, Peter, I didn't mean to cut you off uh, there if I, if I did. No, no, that was good. Um, okay, yeah. Um, anything else there? No. Okay, uh, Connor. Nothing more to add on my end. All righty. Well then, <clears throat> um, ladies and gents, um, if nobody has any final questions or comments, then that will um, conclude the stream for this evening. It'll also conclude our examination of the posters, which is really great. I'm glad that we took three, I think we've had three full sessions on the posters, which is um, what I hoped we'd get to. Um, We've definitely given it a good examination. And, uh, you know, if for no other reason, the posters are something that often, um, we we talk about posters a lot, but we often don't examine them very closely. It's more the scholars that get an opportunity to, to do that. So I'm glad we got the chance to do this, and I hope that this will be something that we'll have available to reflect and go back to once we start to get into the meat of you know the uh, quote unquote <clears throat> fun stuff, the uh, the Largo and the Stretto plays. Because remember, all of this stuff is going to spring from our understanding of the nature of posta and um, what options are available to us in Largo and Stretto. Okay. So um, you guys have, as always, a very safe and wonderful week. And uh, we'll see you back here next uh, Monday. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Great class. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Aaron.